Today's reading is 1 Corinthians 16, 13 through 14. Be careful, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. I have to tell you, my wife was so, so confused about this morning's sermon. You see, last night she texted me and she said, what are you preaching tomorrow for Father's Day? And so I texted back 1 Corinthians 16, 13 through 14. However, she read my text a little too quickly and she thought I had written 1 Corinthians 11, 13 and 14, which reads, judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it's a disgrace for him? Now, that would have been a memorable Father's Day sermon. <laughs> but that's not what we're preaching this, this week. We're looking at 1 Corinthians 16, verses 13 through 14, in which we find five imperatives, five commands that are given, not just to men and fathers, though we're going to talk to men and fathers a lot today, but these are commands given to the whole church. These words in 1 Corinthians 16 come at the very end of the letter. This is the very last chapter of Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. And so in the midst of, of a chapter that, if you read it, is full of travel itineraries, personal greetings, and long goodbyes, Paul can't help himself. He's a preacher at heart. i got to give you a few parting instructions but as I close. And so we find smack in the middle of the chapter, sandwiched in the middle of everything else that's going on, he gives this final parting teaching. Five commands given for the whole church because his desire, when you read the book of Corinthians, which we looked at last year, the church in Corinth was a dumpster fire. It was a mess. And so Paul wants to give them some final parting commands so that in the face of compromise... In the face of a culture that's pushing the church in directions that the church should not be going, that they might stand firm. So these are his final parting commands. And so again, because this is Father's Day and we're going to do a baby dedication where we talk to parents at the end of the service, um, I am going to speak a lot to fathers, to men, and to parents. But again, mothers, women, single men, children, you're not getting out of this. You're not off the hook. For these five commands either because this is a message and these commands apply equally to all of us in the church so let's all of us keep our ears open and our hearts receptive to receive what it is for us in these five commands we begin with the first imperative which is be watchful be watchful now if you look through the whole of the the new testament what we find is that this verb be watchful is used many times but especially by jesus jesus uses it a lot when he warns his disciples be watchful for when i return in fact in mark 13 it's translated as stay awake or wake up church wake up be watchful in fact, we find him in Matthew 24, 42. Jesus says, therefore, stay awake. You don't know on what day your Lord is coming. Friends, be watchful. Stay awake. Fathers, men, this is so vitally important because if you let your guard down, your families, your churches, and this culture will suffer. We need to be awake. We need to be watchful. In fact, the Apostle Peter also uses this command in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, where he says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Why? Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So make no mistake. Make no mistake that if we let our guard down, if we are not watchful, there is a roaring lion, there is a lying serpent ready to devour and destroy our families, our children, our churches. Understand that this is exactly what happened to us men in the Garden of Eden. In Genesis chapter 3, it's abundantly clear that Eve was being tempted by the snake with the forbidden fruit. And you know where Adam was? He was right there with her. 
Genesis 3.16. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her. And he ate. So what was Adam doing while the snake was tempting his wife? He wasn't watchful. He was passive. He was silent. And so it is the scripture condemns Adam for the entrance of sin into the world. Romans 5.12, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, sin entered the world through Adam, through his passivity, because he was not watchful. Husbands and fathers, I believe that when Adam saw that snake in the garden talking to his wife, his responsibility was to grab the snake by its lying throat, throw it to the ground, and crush it underneath his heel. But he didn't. So you know what? God eventually had to send a second Adam to grab the snake, cast it down, and crush it underneath his heel. Because in fact, that's exactly what the Lord said he was going to do when he spoke to the serpent in judgment. The end of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the Lord speaking to the serpent, he says, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head or crush your head and you shall bruise his heel or strike his heel. God says, Adam, the original Adam, failed to be watchful. And this microphone, like all of our microphones, are very much watchful. Yeah. Yeah. We're also having problems with the electronics. Again, I believe that there is an evil spirit. It's legion, and we need to cast it out of these microphones. But I believe that the original Adam was supposed to cast down and crush the serpent, and he didn't. So what did God do? He said, I'm going to send a second Adam. There's going to be another offspring from Adam and Eve who's going to do what the first Adam didn't do. He's going to cast down the serpent, and he's going to crush his head. And friends, that's what Jesus Christ came and did. On the cross, the serpent struck his heel, and Christ died. But in his death and resurrection, Christ crushed the serpent's head. That's the gospel. That's the good news. What we failed to do in resisting the devil, in falling for his lies, Christ has done for us in his life, his death, and his resurrection. Trust in the snake crusher who delivers and by whom we might be forgiven. But church, we're warned by Peter to be wary because our adversary, even though he's defeated, even though the serpent's head was crushed by Christ, he still roams around, as Peter says, like a lion. He's on the prowl. He knows he's defeated, but he's going to take down as many people as he can with him. His doom is sure. It was certain as of the cross of Jesus Christ. But he's going to make sure as many people are deceived and led astray and destroyed with him. And so we have an enemy. So fathers, men, do not make the same mistake our father Adam made in the garden. Be watchful. Wake up. What are you allowing into your minds? What are you allowing into your marriages? What are you allowing into your children's minds and hearts? Are you watchful of what's coming into your home by media and technology? What ideas and philosophies and lies are being taught by our culture that your children are learning and you're letting go unchallenged? What truths are you leaving unspoken to your children because your children are daily being discipled? by the lies of the servant that are serpent that are offered again and again he continues today to offer deadly forbidden fruit are we going to stand passively by men be watchful fathers men parents church we need to wake up we need to be engaged we need to be intentional lest our families lest our children lest our churches be deceived by the lies of the serpent, lest they be consumed by the roaring lion, lest they be taken captive by the lies and ideologies and philosophies of this present darkness. Church, we must be watchful. 
Paul says, be watchful and then stand firm. Stand firm, not just stand firm, but stand firm where? In the faith. Stand firm in the faith. Persist, persevere. Friends, as this culture shifts and moves, becoming progressively unmoored from reality, rationality, biology, morality, stand firm. Remain unmoving, persevering in the truth. Paul says, stand firm. Now, church, sometimes you find truth in the most unexpected of places. In the comic book, Amazing Spider-Man 537, <laughs> yes, I'm a bit of a geek, superhero Captain America was giving a pep talk to Spider-Man, who's much younger than him. And Captain America delivered this speech. It doesn't matter what the press says. It doesn't matter what the politicians or the mob say. It doesn't matter if the whole country decides that something wrong is something right. This nation was founded on one principle above all else, the requirement that we stand up for what we believe, no matter the odds or the consequences. When the mob and the press and the whole world tell you to move, your job is to plant yourself like a tree beside the river of truth and tell the whole world, no, you move. Church, stand firm. When the mob and the press and the whole world tell you to move, to bow, to compromise, your job is to plant yourself like a tree beside the river of truth and say to the world, no, you move. Stand firm. Church, un the unmoving, unyielding truth in which we plant ourselves, on which we stand firm, is the unchanging word of God. Paul writes to the church in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15, So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. Church, we must stand firm in the orthodox, trustworthy, historic understanding of the unchanging, unshifting, unalterable word of God. Fathers, men, parents, church, you need to be firm on what the Word of God says. You need to know why it's true. You need to know how to rightly interpret and apply the Word of God. You need to know how to answer the challenges and questions of this culture and this day so that in the face of the mob and the media and the culture, you might stand firm. Fathers, train yourself that you might train your family to stand firm in the word of God. It's what the Lord has commanded of us fathers. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Friends, study after study, statistic after statistic have shown that the man sets the spiritual tone for the family. If you faithfully go to church, statistically, it's more likely that your children will faithfully go to church and your family will go. If you regularly study and value the word of God statistically, it is more likely that your children will value and trust the word of God. Now understand, I'm not saying this to diminish the influence of a godly mother because godly mothers make a tremendous impact upon their children. I'm emphasizing that there is an importance of the father, that he must stand firm in the faith and lead his family to do the same. And church, let's step back for a second and let's all stop lying to ourselves. Because we all have excuses for not doing this more, don't we? I'm too busy. I don't have time. But church, we know that's a lie. You know that's a lie. Because statistically, the number of hours that we spend on social media, the number of hours that we watch TV, the sacrifices we're willing to make to go watch the big game in person, the early mornings we get up to go fish or hunt or do our hobby, if we took only a fraction of that time and we engaged intentionally in the word of God, if we had just a fraction of the passion 
to engage the word of God with which we engage in our hobbies, we would be a bold, knowledgeable, and unstoppable army ready to teach, live, defend, promote the word of God in the face of the mob, the media, and the man. Today, there is an outright attack on the authority of the tr and the truthfulness of God's word. The mob and the media are telling us that if you hold to biblical orthodoxy or basic biology, you're a bigot and a hater, so you better move. Church, we will be those who stand firm, planted like a tree by the river of truth, ready to tell the whole world, no, you move. Because the word of God does not. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, and act like men. Act like men. Now, to be clear, when Paul says act like men, he's not contrasting men with women. He's contrasting men with boys. In fact, a couple chapters previous in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11, Paul writes, When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man. I gave up childish ways. So the command here is not don't be a girl. The command is don't be a big baby. The command is grow up. Grow up. Act like men. The command act like man, men is actually frequently found in the Greek translation of the Old Testament because act like men was used to encourage especially soldiers as they went to the battlefield to be courageous and strong and obedient to their commanders. In fact, 1 Samuel chapter 4 record, records this charge to the Philistine army. It said, take courage and be men, O Philistines, lest you become slaves to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. Put on your big boy pants and go into battle. Be men, hear the call, and heed the call. And men, if we've ever needed this call, we need it today. You know, last December, I stumbled on an article titled, The Christian Case for Captain Hook. The Christian Case for Captain Hook. The author writes, I spent way too many years of my life cheering for the bad guy in the Walt Disney classic, Peter Pan. The older and hopefully wiser I get, I regret seeing Pan as the hero and Hook as the villain. The overarching metaphor of the story is that Hook represents the adult that Pan saw himself growing into. Thus, the boy fiercely fought off the oppressive forces of maturity. Friends, Pan's message was, I don't want to grow up. I don't want to be responsible for anyone other than myself. I want to make life all about me. The good life is about me getting what I want when I want it. And anything or anything that gets in the way should be fought, resisted, and mocked. Men, stop acting like Peter Pan. Grow up. Act like men. I have watched too many marriages where the man treats his wife like his mother. Or where he makes his wife Captain Hook. The husband lets his wife be the bad guy when it comes to enforcing boundaries or enforcing mutual agreements. The husband forces his wife to make the hard decision, so if it doesn't go well, she'll be the one who takes the blame. The husband lets his wife be the bad guy when it comes to disciplining the children. The husband refuses to be responsible for himself, his wife, or his children. The husband plays Peter Pan and forces his wife to become Captain Hook. This shouldn't be. Act like men. Grow up. Take responsibility not only for yourself. Take responsibility for your wife and for your children. Act like men and lead. Lead the way that Jesus taught us to lead men. Jesus taught us what leadership is in Luke 22, verse 25 and 26. The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest and the leader as one who serves. Husbands, lead by taking responsibility for the needs of your wife and your children above your own. 
When sacrifices have to be made, husbands, you take the lead and volunteer. When rights have to be given up, husbands, be the first one to offer. When there's a job that neither one of you wants to do, husbands, step forward. When there's unresolved conflict, stop waiting on her to take the first move. You take the first move. Confess your sin and address your own issues regardless of her response. If the passion is gone, stop looking elsewhere and stop looking at pornography. You take the initiative to reignite that flame. Husbands, take the lead by taking responsibility to serve her and your children above your own needs. Stop playing Peter Pan and act like men. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, and be strong. This, in some ways, could be the most controversial of these points, because nowadays, any display of strength is called toxic masculinity, or at least it risks being called toxic. Today, we're actively neutering our men, either verbally by making them ashamed of their strength, or now literally with chemicals and surgery. But friends, strength and power are not in and of it themselves toxic. Power out of control is what's toxic and dangerous. A campfire and a wildfire are the exact same fire and the exact same power. But the first is in control and it's useful for warmth and for cooking. The second is out of control and it's destructive. Friends, when you tame a horse, you don't actually remove that horse's raw power. The horse is just as powerful, but now that power has been brought under control. So instead of dangerous and destructive, the power of the horse is now useful. Strength is not a bad thing. Power is not a bad thing. Masculinity is not a bad thing. In fact, we celebrate when strength is under control and when it's used for the benefit of others. We praise our military and our police when they channel their power and their strength to shield the innocent and to deliver children from abuse and to protect women from violence. We celebrate that. So strength and power do not automatically mean abuse. And friends, another myth that's out there is that religion, specifically Christianity itself, is often cast as a cause of domestic abuse. However, there's a book coming out that I've pre-ordered and seen some of already and very excited to read by Nancy Piercy. It's called The Toxic War on Masculinity. And one of, her, one of the things the research has clearly shown is that authentically committed Christian men test out as the most loving and engaged husbands and fathers. They have the lowest rates of divorce and domestic violence of any group in America. Strength doesn't automatically make men abusive. Religion doesn't automatically make men abusive. The answer to abusive strength is not weakness. We don't need weak men. What we need are gentlemen. We need gentlemen. Gentle like Jesus. Friends, read the Gospels. Jesus' opponents all the time looked at him and noted how strong he was. And thus how dangerous he was to them. They noted that his power and his strength, and he spoke with authority. But Jesus was never abusive. He was always gentle. His strength was under control. It was not used for his own benefit. His strength was used for the benefit of others. A gentle man, a gentleman, is not weak. He's a man whose power is under control, whose power is channeled, not selfishly, but for the benefit of others. Strength and masculinity themselves are not toxic. Strength should not be shamed, drugged, or surgically removed from our men. Strength needs to be trained and channeled, put under control, so that our men and our fathers might become gentlemen. Gentlemen. Whose strength is used for the benefit of their wives, their children, their churches, their community. So be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, and finally let all that you do let all that you do, church, be done in love. The Apostle Paul committed a whole chapter of the letter of 1 Corinthians to the topic of love. And in that chapter, what we clearly learned was that love is not a feeling, but a choice. Church, love is not a feeling. Love is a choice. And the description of love that we get in 1 Corinthians 13 is not emotional, but very practical. 1 Corinthians 13, starting in verse 4. Love is patient 
and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So friends, letting all that you do be done in love doesn't mean that you do everything with some kind of flowery emotion or a warm, fuzzy feeling in your heart. Letting all you do be done in love is a choice in how you relate to other persons. To relate with patience and with kindness without arrogance or irritation. And this is a scary, scary passage when you try to apply it to yourself. Adam is patient and kind. He does not envy or boast. I'm going to stop going there because I have a long way to go. Love is a choice. Love is a choice. So let all you do, how you relate to others, be done in love. And church, just one comment. In today's culture, I want to note two important things that love cannot do. And that's in verse 6. Love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Friends, love does not and cannot rejoice with unrighteousness. Love cannot celebrate that which is evil, immoral, or a violation of God's word. And true love does not rejoice in lies. True love can only rejoice in truth. So love cannot affirm or live by lies. And friends, this culture today has redefined love to mean that you must accept fully everything which someone says or wants if you really love them. But true love is unable to rejoice in unrighteousness, and true love cannot live by lies. Friends, love is not some flowery, squishy emotion, and love does not celebrate unrighteousness or affirm untruth. Love is a commitment to choose to will the good and the true and the right in your relationship with others. So be watchful. Stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, and let all that you do be done in love. Fathers, mothers, men and women, Church of Jesus Christ, these five commandments, they should guide us. They should guide us as parents as we raise our children. They should shape our life together as we build community. And they should characterize the life that we live before a watching world so that we might bring glory to Jesus Christ. Of these five commitments, how does the Lord want to grow you today? How do you need to cooperate with the work of his spirit in your life right now? Let's pray. Father, help us. Help us as we seek to live as men, as women, as parents, and as your people in this culture. Help us where we're weak, strengthen us, and use us that the glory of Christ might be known in our families, in our lives, and through your church now and forevermore. Amen. Oh, Mike H., is that one crackling? Mike H., is this one crackling too? Crackle, crackle. Yeah, no, I heard it crackling all the way through. Yeah. So if you have spiritual gifts in technology, we could use another AV person or two. I'm not even on. I don't even know what's going on. I'm completely off. I don't even know what's going on. Okay. What? Yeah, mute everything except for channel H. All right? We're going to try that. That should be fun. over there yet. Okay, in just a moment, Ian and Erica Clark and Carl and Becca Santiago are going to bring their daughters, Olivia and Gloriana, forward to dedicate them to the Lord. Now, I announced last week that we were going to have three child dedications. And then, you know, what happens is I was asked and they said, Adam, how are you going to handle three babies? You only have two arms. And I said, I'm good at juggling. And next thing you know, the McDonald's didn't want to do it anymore. <laughs> I don't know what happened. In all seriousness, the McDonald's ended up with a conflict, and so they said, can we do a dedication um, the first week in July? And so we will dedicate baby Noah, but it will be the first week in July. So today we're dedicating the girls 
and in July we'll dedicate the boy. So, but as we come to talk about a child dedication, some here might not be familiar with this concept of a child dedication, so just a brief explanation before I bring the families forward. Now, to understand what a child dedication is, let's understand what it's not. A child dedication isn't related to circumcision. Um, the Jewish people, to this day, they have their male children circumcised on the eighth day, and it's a sign of the covenant that God made with Abraham and all of his descendants. But we're no longer under the old covenant of Abraham. We're under the new covenant that's been established by the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we're no longer bound by the practice of circumcision. Now, neither is a child dedication related to baptism. Upon confession of faith, baptism is the public act of being fully immersed in water. By faith, you're buried into the death of Jesus Christ. And by faith, you rise again to life. As Colossians chapter 2, verse 12 says, having been buried with Jesus in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God. So we don't baptize infants, but we follow the clear example of scripture where we find that every recorded baptism in scripture was accompanied by a confession of faith in Jesus Christ. So that being said, with our actions today, we're all going to join together in hope and prayer with these parents. Because these parents come today in hope and prayer that both Olivia and Gloriana will one day make that confession of faith and at that time be baptized. So a child dedication isn't related to circumcision or baptism. Neither can a child dedication save a child. Friends, everything that we do today, say, promise, pray, it doesn't automatically mean the child's going to be spiritual or saved or destined for heaven. So considering all the things it's not, what are we doing here today? The Bible tells us that children are a gift from God. And Psalm 127.3 declares, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. So we recognize that children are a gift from the Lord, and they belong first and foremost to God. In his goodness, God has given children as a gift to parents. We recognize that with this gift comes awesome responsibilities and the privilege of caring for and enjoying and raising these children. Because children belong to God and they're given as a grace to parents, it's only appropriate that children be dedicated back to raise them before the Lord. We read in 1 Samuel chapter 1 that Hannah presented her son Samuel to the Lord, that he might be trained in the knowledge of, ser knowledge of and service to his name. So while our situation today is different than theirs, the parents come today in the same spirit. They're bringing their daughters, dedicating them to be raised in the knowledge of and service to the Lord. So Ian and Erica, Carl and Becca, at this time, would you come forward and bring Olivia and Gloriana? closer why don't you come stand on the other side okay. family and church family hear the command of scripture that's given to us in Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 4 through 7 hear O Israel the Lord our God the Lord is one you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul with all your mind these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You should teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. Again, Proverbs 22, 6 instructs, train up a child in the way she should go. And when she is old, she will not depart from it. Ephesians 6, 4, which we've already read today. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. So Ian and Erica, Carl and Becca, by coming forward before God and his people, do you hereby publicly before these witnesses declare your intention to dedicate yourselves to bringing up your daughter, Olivia and Gloriana, in the discipline and instruction of the Lord? And if so, please respond by saying, we do. 
Having come freely, I ask now that you enter into the following commitment in the promise, in the presence of God and his people. So we're going to start over here. So that Olivia may walk in the abundant life that Christ offers. Do you, Ian and Erica, vow by God's help and in partnership with the church to provide Olivia a Christian home of love and peace, to raise her in the truth of our Lord's instruction and discipline, to teach her diligently obedience to the commands of the Lord, talking of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise, and encouraging Olivia to one day trust Jesus as her Savior and Lord. If so, please respond by saying, we do. And Carl and Becca, so that Gloriana may walk in the abundant life that Christ offers, do you, Carl and Becca, vow by God's help and in partnership with the church to provide Gloriana a Christian home of love and peace, to raise her in the truth of our Lord's instruction and discipline, to teach her diligently obedience to the commands of the Lord, talking of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise, and encouraging Gloriana to one day trust Jesus as her Savior and Lord. If you do, please respond by saying, we do. Church, we recognize the responsibility for raising children in the faith is too great for parents to do alone. These children belong, first of all, to the Lord and then to the, are entrusted to parents. So it is parents who have the God-given right to raise their children, and parents must take the lead in doing so. But God in his goodness has given the gift of his church, a community of faith so that we can help and support one another on this pilgrim journey. And for this reason, these parents are here this morning to call on you, church, you, congregation, to walk with them. So would you all please stand? <laughs> Having come freely, Chestnut Street Baptist Church, I ask now that you make the following commitment to those who stand before you, so that Olivia and Gloriana may walk in the abundant life that Christ offers. Do you all vow, by God's help, to be faithful in your calling as members of the body of Christ to help these parents be faithful to God, to serve these parents and children by volunteering regularly for, by, for nursery, staffing gratefully our children's ministries, praying fervently for these families, by speaking to Olivia and Gloriana of the wonderful things the Lord has done. So encouraging them to one day trust Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. And if you do, church family, respond by saying, we do. We do. Remain standing as we pray for God's blessing upon these children. For safety's sake, I think I'll just hold their hands. <laughs> Welcome, Olivia and Gloriana. Blessed are you beyond telling to be born to parents who love you, who love each other, and who most of all love the Lord. How blessed you are to be surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, this expression of the body of Christ, that you might grow surrounded by his word, songs, prayers, and fellowship of God's people. May Christ be near you now in each hour of your life. And year by passing year, may the knowledge of his presence, may the sound of his voice and the call of his spirit be ever greater for you. May you one day soon respond in faith, confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. And Olivia and Gloriana, may the Lord God Almighty bless you and may he keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and may he be gracious to you. And may the Lord's presence be with you and may he give you his peace today and forevermore. Amen.